<laughs> okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's UE Cyber Seminar. So this week we've got LT Harper joining us and they're going to be running a workshop today talking about the cyber security industry, where to start. So just a little bit from the blurb that you'll have seen. Here at LT Harper, we know that breaking into any industry is tough. Cyber is no different. Because of this, we are committed to giving students and grads as much advice as we can to make this transition seamless and stress-free. Join our free webinar hosted by specialists and experienced cyber recruiters for some insights into the various opportunities within cyber, how to get there, and tried and tested CV and interview tips. The session will end in a brief Q&A session to give you a chance to clarify anything you're still unsure about. So feel free to come with lots of questions. So I hope you've got lots of questions. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Laura, who's going to kick us off. So over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura. I'm the Marketing and Social Media Associate here at LT Harper. Um, we're just here today to just talk to you guys a little bit about getting started in the cyber industry because, um, you know, as Phil said, we know that it can be really tough breaking into any industry where really, cyber is absolutely no different. Um, so joining me on this call are my colleagues Catherine, Ella and Ryan, who are some of our specialist consultants here at LT Harper. We're just going to talk to you a little bit about who we are and what we do here at LT Harper and then give you some background about the opportunities within cyber and finish up with some CV and interview tips, you know, that in our experience of dealing with clients particularly can really help to set you guys apart when you're looking for your first jobs, second jobs or whatever. Um, so as Phil said, we will leave some time for questions at the end and you can submit these at any point um, throughout the presentation via the chat box. We will ask you all to keep your microphones and videos off until this point. You know, if you do have a question you want to ask, feel free to, you know, show your face, unmute yourself, whatever, um, if that's easier for you. But we just want to make sure that our broadband's hung up. We're probably going to do the same thing because you know what Wi-Fi can be like. Um, so that's kind of how the session's going to look. Before I go any further into what we're going to be talking about today, um, I'm briefly going to just touch on how the recruitment services work because I think there is this common misconception about them. I certainly didn't know how they worked until a few months ago when I joined LT Harper. I think there is this common misconception that you guys, the candidates, pay for them. You pay a recruiter to find you a job. It's not really how it works at all. Um, you pay nothing. So really, it's you know in your best interest to use recruitment services because it's only the clients that pay. Um, all, you know, all you're doing is kind of letting yourself be helped, really. So, um, yes, yeah, so that's kind of how it works. All you do is sit back and let the recruiters do the work. Um, we, I will just kind of preface and say our clients at the moment haven't really offered us many grad or student roles, um, unless maybe a couple of years experience under your belts already. But, um, you know, don't worry. Absolutely nobody expects you to have loads of experience at this point. Um, it's simply to do with what our clients can and currently can and can't offer us. So, um, but please do feel free to follow us on LinkedIn. In the meantime, we do post loads of career resources, um, and all of our jobs will be on there as well, so that you know we can help you perhaps in the near future. Um, if not with jobs, then definitely with um, the resources that we publish. So, I'm just going to start the presentation now. Let me just share my screen. Do let me know if you can see it. One second. Sorry. <laughs> Can you see it? Yeah. Yep. Brilliant. Okay. So. Who are we in LT Harper? So we are a full service cybersecurity recruitment agency and we operate mainly across the UK and Europe. And we're actually one of the only pure play cyber specialists and we offer a full suite of services, including permanent, contingent and executive search. And um, something that we're really developing a lot recently as well is our complimentary mentoring service to help develop and upskill female cyber talent particularly. So if that's something you might be interested in, please do kind of stay tuned with us um, for that. We're definitely really going to push that in the next few weeks. Um, and we now have dedicated teams across each of our areas of specialisation as well. 
And we find that this pinpointed approach has really enabled us to build a growing network of candidates uh, and customers within each of the areas. Um, and our Associate Director, Catherine, is going to tell you a little bit more about that, all of that now. So without further ado, I will pass over to you, Catherine. Thank you, Laura. Um, yeah, so I'm Catherine Byrne, um, one of the directors here at LT Harper. Um, so I started recruitment back in 2006, so about 15 years ago. Um, so yeah, I just want to talk to you guys, um, and, and and I apologise if you know some of this, some of the, the you know the material in here is is you know is is more for kind of. Uh, younger grads, but I know we've got some probably we might have some a couple of experienced, um, you know, cyber folk in here who have who have maybe contracted. I know we found that in the past. So, um, uh, you know, for me, what what I really want to talk to you guys about is the areas that we cover. Um, some of the areas I find that are, are really good starting points for cyber um, and just kind of cover a lot of the questions that people ask me when they say, look, Catherine, how do I get into cyber? How do I get in, you know, how do I get into the infosec space? Things like that. Um, and hopefully as well, I can give you some keywords just to write down. I can give you a few tips. Um, I'm not technical. Um, so, uh, you know, I apologize again if I if I say something that isn't technically the right word. Um, but yeah, so from from LT Harper, we cover a number of areas. So I'd say the majority of the roles that we're working now and have been over the last couple of years, they range from things like security operations, which is your blue team, to pen testing, which is your red team. We cover a lot of GRC, which is your governance, risk and compliance. Um, we also do a lot of security engineering. We do infrastructure security, um, network security. We cover cloud security. Um, and, you know, we cover a lot of architect roles as well. So you can see there's quite a range of, of different areas. And there's so many new subheadings coming up, um, which we'll move on to in a second. So um, if I talk about kind of the top three questions I get asked from grads, um, you know, the first question I say, you know, I, people ask me is, what's the best route into cyber? You know, how, how can I get a role in cyber? Um, and generally, I think there's there's a number of different ways. So you could, you know, you could come in from a, a development side, an infrastructure side or an analyst side. But I always put that back to, to the actual student themselves or the person I'm talking to themselves and say, you know, what, what are your strengths? You know, what, what, what kind of role do you want to work in? You know, are you client facing or are you non-client facing? Are you technical or are you non-technical? So, for example, I have many clients who have said to me, you know, a pen testing client who has said, can you find me someone who is, you know, who's, can you find me a hacker who's maybe been hacking their computer games in their bedroom when, since they were 12 years old and they don't need to wear a suit, they don't need to be client facing, you know, they can come and work for me, they'll work remotely and, you know, I'll get them hacking stuff for our clients, you know, so that's a prime example of a non-client facing, a very technical role, um, you know, and again, you, you don't have to be out and about maybe talking to clients too much if you don't want to. Um, the other side of that is, you know, maybe you are a real people person. Maybe you you want to be out consulting and advising and giving advice and, you know, implementing solutions from start to finish. And those types of roles are maybe more your security consultant roles. And you've got, you know, you've got the huge consultancies that are out there. You've also got a lot of more boutique consultancies. And you also have roles in the middle where, you know, we, we've got a client who I've just placed two really junior pen testers um, who actually came from a webinar like this, actually, who had just done their OSCP and had about six months experience doing pen testing. Um, and they were both really strong client facing technical pen testers um, who, yeah, who, who, who wanted a bit of a mixture of a role. So, so yeah, for me, I always go back to, to people and say, look, have a look at where your strengths lie are you a developer are you a coder you know do you want to be analytical you know do, are you interested in the policy side of things or are you interested in more you know the real technical side of things and if you are a real technical person you, you've got there's so many other areas you can go into you've got the blue team which is your security operations the red team which is your ethical ha hacking your pen testing you've got security engineering I, I find those roles are, are more when you're going in and you're you're engineering a solution for clients um, you know, there's yeah, there's there's lots of different areas. So I always try and put that back to 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 people as well. Um, the best certifications. I'm going to come on to a slide in that in a second. So that'll be the next slide. Um, and and the other question is, what's the quickest way to becoming a CISO? So if we can just move on to the to the next slide, Laura, that'd be really helpful. So 
This is actually probably a bit out of date now. Um, and there's always so many new certifications. Lots of companies have a preference on what sort of certifications they like. So some people will like people to be Crest certified or from Tiger Scheme or, or you know, or, or some clients are just not bothered about certifications. Um, a, a, a question which always comes up is, you know, do I need certifications to get into cyber? For some clients you do, for some clients you don't, it, you know, it really depends. It really, really depends. Um, so just to have a look at this chart, which we will share with you guys at the end, you know, I've spoken about blue team and red team and security engineering. So red team, offensive operations, pen testing, ethical hacking, um, you know, this is your, you, 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 your, your, you know, you're offending against the security alerts or the security incidents that are coming in. You know, you're, you're, you're going out and you're, you're looking for those vulnerabilities. So you've got some of your basic entry certifications like Security Plus down the bottom, which is your purple, CEH, which we see a lot, which is quite a beginner. It's definitely a beginner um, certification in pen testing. And then you go all the way up to the top and you've got your OSCP, your OSCEs. I have said this before on 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 one of these um, presentations. If you know if you've got a couple of months pen testing experience and you've got an OSCP, please come and talk to me. You know, and you're looking and you're, you're on the lookout for a role. You know, that's those types of qualifications and that experience. If you've been doing hack the box and things like that, brilliant. You know, you, you, that for me is someone who is really interested in pen testing and has done everything they can. You know, to to portray themselves as someone who wants to get into that pen test space. Um, and it's quite competitive. I'm not going to lie. You know, we, we we I speak to a lot of people sometimes who they've done a few, you know, they've done their CEH and maybe they want, you know, they, they, they can't afford to do the OSCP. So there's other things you can do. You can you can go and you can do hackathons. You can do hack the box. So um, you just make sure that you're you know, if you, if you can't afford that OSCP, you're doing everything else you can and you're getting your you're, you're following things on LinkedIn, which Ryan's going to talk to you a little bit more about. But, you, you, you know, you really are that person on your CV, which shows that you are, red, you know, you are red team, you are offensive security. Everything you do live and breathe is 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 pen testing. Um, and you've got the blue team. If you look at the defensive operations, also known as security operations, SecOps, whatever you want to call it. Um, again, you might have your basic entry level security plus. Um, then you might come up here for your, I don't know, your GSEC or your CYSA. Um, so, like I said, this might be a little bit out of date. You you always want to choose your area in security um, and, and, and then you can start to think from there. So really think about what particular area you want to go into um, and then you start to look at the certifications from that particular area. So if you can move on to the next slide for me, please, Laura. So core areas, I mentioned a few of these at the beginning, which was, you know, your red team, your blue team, security engineering, your infrastructure engineering, your network engineering, your cloud security, your GRC, which is governance, risk and compliance. Um, there's so many different areas. There's so many new areas that are coming out. Cloud, cloud security is not exactly new, but there's there's things like um, IoT. So there's a little square down here, which is industrial IoT security. That is a really interesting area, which we to be honest, we didn't have loads of jobs in, in that particular area for the first couple of years when we started off. But as we really penetrated the job market and we, we became niche specialists within cybersecurity, we had a lot of organisations come to us for these really niche roles. To give you an understanding of what that is, that's, um, that is securing critical infrastructure. That is securing these, these uh, huge old, not old, maybe, well, maybe they are, operational tech, industrial control systems. You know, these are, these are systems that need to be secure because they're used by critical infrastructure like energy companies or power companies or, or anything like that, you know. So that is a whole niche area within itself. Um, you know, I see on people's CVs, operational tech, industrial control security, you know, which is very different to someone who's calling themselves a, you know, a pen tester or a security operations analyst or um, a, a cloud architect. There will always be a crossover, you know, because each company, you know, each company has a different need. You have some companies where you can go in and be an absolute SME. You can be, a, you know, a subject matter expert. You can be a pure um, you know, blue team security operations, you know, person, and you start off as a security analyst, you then work your way up to like a level two security operations analyst, you might then want to specialize in threat intelligence or incident response. And then you might want to move into cloud and you might want to, you know, become a, a cloud specialist. So, so there's, 
your journey in cyber might change and there's so many different you know ways it might take you know turns it might take and each company is different you know a, a, a security team in one company might consist of one or two people and if that's the case then you probably need to cover every area in security and you're probably never going to be able to delve too deep into it but you might also be you know or maybe you will maybe you'll cover it all um it depends what your capacity is um other areas you know for example justy who we work with they have very siloed teams. They have an application security team, a cloud security team, a security operation team, a pen testing team, an infrastructure security team, a security engineering team, you know, um, and there's 10 people in each of those teams that are that are all really delving deep into all of that. So, so again, we'll share this with you. There's, there's lots of core areas, lots of them overlap. Um, but my advice to you is to really have a think about what you what you you know what area you think you want to move into, um, and and have a look at you know any any certifications, any courses, or anything that go that go around that. And for me, the best thing is to go and look on LinkedIn and look at some of the job adverts and read read what these job adverts sound like. You know, related to cloud security or GRC or pen testing, and see if that sounds like you. If you can move on to my next slide, please, Laura. So the most common the most common roles I, I see in the market, um, they're not going to be an architect role. They're not going to be a, you know, a CISO, you know, or anything like that, because you need to go in and you need to learn the basics. You need to, you know, you need to be able to understand how it's all put together. You need to be, you need to start from 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 the bottom, I suppose. Um, so a, a lot of the roles I see are analyst roles, you know, and if you think of a role of, of an analyst, you're going in and you are, um, you're researching, you're gathering information, you're looking at it and you're seeing how it correlates and then you're reporting on it and you're giving that information probably to someone who's a bit more senior who's then going to go and look at that and say, right, this is what we need to do with it. Um, or, or maybe you've been a, a developer or maybe you've got some program experience or, 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 or maybe you can do some incident response or something like that. And that's dealing with some of the more low level incidents. Um, I've seen a lot of people come from help desk or infrastructure roles or networking roles and and they've then got a role as a stock analyst in a security operations center. That's a really good transition of your of your skills um, from from a from a networking role to a security role. That's that's probably one of the uh, the, the biggest trends I've seen of, of people moving from from like a technical role into a security technical role. Um, I see a lot of you know I suppose GRC roles, so understanding some of the compliance around security. Um, and it might be that you're going and you're teaching other, you know, you go into an organization, and you're teaching all the other teams of people and all the other non-security or non-technical people. You're teaching them all about security, safeguarding, and that can get a bit technical as well. So, yeah, the most common roles I've seen are security analysts, security operations, maybe an infosec analyst, um, some engineering roles as well. Um, but again, with, with those particular roles, things that are, I've you know, I suppose key words and key skills I've seen people that they had to pick up are, are things like scene tools, which are um, they are. And you guys probably know this better than I do. Um, they're, they're tools, I suppose, which businesses use to, to help, uh, you know, help automate or to help them understand what security incidents, what, you know, what security yeah, incidents are coming into the business. So there's lots of scene tools that you guys probably have heard of, Splunk, QRadar, things like that. So again, that just comes back to my point, which is, you know, you can't, you know, you're not going to go into security and be a security architect. You've got to understand um, how you build something, how it's designed. You know, you've really got to understand how it's all put together before you can then go on to work your way up the ladder and become a, a security architect. Generally, security architects, you know, will will understand how everything is designed and built and they're looking at more the full life cycle. Um, and again, you know, that I suppose that that end goal for most people in, in cybersecurity is that chief information security officer role, which is your CISO role. So I, I hope you all get to that position at some point as well. And I think that's it from me, Laura. Is that right? Right, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Catherine. We'll move on to Ella now, who's going to talk to you guys a little bit about CV tips. Hi, guys. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what managers want and what they look for with regards to a CV. So to give you guys a little bit of insight to what happens once you've sent off your CV, and that will really hopefully help you guys make the best first impression. 
So with every job that we work on, we sit down and we book out an hour with a hiring manager to work exactly what they're looking for. Um, and this is a really critical part of the job hunting process. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people look, may have here may have looked at a job description for a pen tester or a SOC analyst role and thought, okay, it sounds like your bog standard pen tester or SOC analyst role. But the problem with job descriptions is that they often don't give you um, that bigger picture insight. So with a client, we discuss things like personality, um, motivation, what kind of workplace culture they have, um, how the role will evolve in the future, what their plans are for this person, what they like about their current team. And I think that this, I'm sure that Catherine and Ryan would agree, this is a really good one because it allows people to really identify what they want to replicate in the next hire that they make. Um, but also things like what new things will they learn to make them stronger cybersecurity professionals. Um, so if we could just change the slide, please, Ryan. So in order to help you guys understand how important the CV is in the job hunting process, um, we pulled together some stats. So an average of half of all CVs that are longer than two page are discarded. 52% of candidates believe that it's necessary to lie in order to get an interview. Now, some of these I would describe as being things that I would agree with and some of them I wouldn't. Um, you know, things like half of all CVs that are more than two pages discarded. You know, if you're someone that has 10, 15 years experience specialising, then obviously it will be a, a longer CV to read. Um, but you do just want to make sure that, you know, you are being concise if you haven't had that much industry experience. Um, probably the most interesting one is that a CV is your best impression with a potential new manager. And you might be an A-star candidate, but if you don't have a CV that reflects that, it can be quite hard to get an interview from that process. Um, so if you want to change the slide, Laura. So what I would say is that one of the number one errors made by people applying to jobs is that they use the same CV for 30 different positions. So I guess a really good way to think about it is would you use the same CV for, for a pen tester as an engineer? And the answer is no, because they do completely different things. So try to think about this when you're applying to positions, tweak your CV and make changes to reflect each role that you apply to. If they want experience in something like you know, hacking, show that you've done some online forums or capture the flag. But equally, if you're implying to be a consultant, then show some examples of really strong communication skills. Um, so actually, I worked with a candidate a couple of months ago um, who had no pen testing experience um, commercially. So he had done some pen testing in his free time, but hadn't worked as a pen tester before. Um, and we placed him and a company that really loved him. And one of the things that stood out to me on his CV was that he had listed the fact that he was um, his class valedictorian, which I'm not sure if everyone here is familiar with that concept, but in essence, it means that you are the kind of highest achieving, highest performing class member um, of your year at university. So I knew based on that, that he would be someone that was an A-star candidate. So do think about, you know, writing and making sure that you're including your kind of key achievements when you're applying to roles as well. Um, so a couple of things that I would say is chronology, make sure that it's in the right order. Um, this is not something that when I was at university, I was aware of. So you want to make sure that you're doing it in a reverse chronological order, starting with your most recent position at the top. Um, another thing is relevance. Make sure that you're prioritizing your content. If you're applying to be in cyber, but you previously worked in a creative industry, then make sure that you really make it apparent that you're doing things to actively get into cybersecurity. Obviously, you know, everything is relevant, but you don't want to start your CV off by talking about, you know, a creative industry that you worked in if you're applying to be in cybersecurity, because those things do not have a lot of overlap. Um, so think about things like, you know, different different elements um, and different things that you do in your personal time to convey switching, um, you know, in a new direction if you don't have a lot of industry experience. So that can be things like hack the box, capture the flag, home labs, um, personal achievements at your time during university, like, you know, leading groups, like being a valedictorian, um, the groups that you are part of on LinkedIn, online forums that you're involved in, online learning platforms, networking events that you attend. Um, so these are a good way of kind of showing that you do other things beyond just, you know, I went and got my degree in that way. Um, 
Another thing that I would mention is buzzwords are really crucial. Make sure that when someone reads over your CV, they're going to be picking out keywords that are relevant to the job description. If they talk about a tool or a technique, make sure that that's clearly repeated. Obviously, within this, what I would say is don't exaggerate or lie about that experience. Um, you know, if a client is asking for a certain level of exposure to Splunk, for instance, you can talk about how you've done Splunk fundamentals or it's something that you, you know, work on in your home labs. But obviously, you know, if those aren't things that you've done, then you have to be truthful about that experience. Um, the other thing that I would say is progression. Very rarely do people's jobs stay the exactly, exactly the same. If someone has worked somewhere for four years, most of the time their role will look very different to when they first started to now. So what you want to do is make sure that you show that the new responsibilities that you took on um, are there so that you show that you're somebody who can grow. So in your case, you might want to consider the different, try different ways that you've tried to gain experience if you haven't had a job yet. So that might be things like skills that are relevant from previous roles or other things that you do in your spare time and the way that you've progressed and picked up those new skills. Um, so the next thing I would say is clarity. Um, this is really critical. You want to make sure that you are being very clear around how much experience you've had with certain things. So if you're listing a tool, you want to make sure you're being honest about that level of experience with that tool. Um, something else that we see quite regularly is people will leave off the month dates that they were a company for and just put the years. This can end up being causing a little bit of frustration and confusion for the client. Um, you want to make sure that you're being really clear about your experience. And if you were to list 2017 to 2018, that could mean anywhere from three months to 12 in that time period. So it's really important to be exact. Um, and a company will always appreciate that when reading your CV. And then that kind of leads on to the final point around building a great CV, which is honesty. I would say that this is probably the most important part of any job search. If you've had a personal event or a reason for leaving a job early, just make it clear by putting a small note on your CV. Companies will completely appreciate that you guys might not have had a lot of experience and they don't expect you to have X amount of years in a job in cyber. But what they will want to see is examples of how you've actively taken on, you know, independent learning. So make any any clear examples of this um, will really go a really long way. Research definitely shows that a lot of people think that it's appropriate to lie about their skill set on their CVs and in interviews to get ahead. And unfortunately, so the client can always tell. Um, for you guys, one of the suggestions that I would make is perhaps putting together a skills based CV that focuses more on how you've tried to develop and grow rather than a professional resume that focuses on a time spent in a job. So a lot of grads send CVs to us that can look blank because they write a professional CV talking about the jobs that they've done in the past, but unfortunately they just haven't done that many jobs. Um, and writing something instead that emphasizes your skill set will really stand out when hiring managers look at it. So the final thing that I would say, Laura, if we could just turn the slide over, is I want to talk a little bit about virtual CVs. Um, Look, LinkedIn has massively changed how we look for jobs and is an incredible resource to advertise yourself to companies. At this point, you guys might not have a LinkedIn page um, and it might seem a little bit daunting to create one as well, but it's super normal to think, what would I put on it if I haven't started my career yet? And in many ways, think of it as a university application, list extracurricular things that you do, volunteer work, projects, qualifications that you're working towards, and if you have an idea of what you'd like to go into, there is absolutely no harm in connecting with people at other companies that work in this area. It's often really helpful to see what they do, how they got there themselves, and any opportunities that they might be advertising independently. So make sure you're updating it regularly with the new things that you're doing. Think as much about soft skills as technical skills, and most importantly, engage with people. Comment on things, follow companies, join groups to see what they're doing. Um, some of the groups are more recreational than others, but think of it as a virtual as virtual networking in a way that you can get exposure to the professional world without me meeting people directly. Um, so it's yeah, it's a really good opportunity for you to network at home and self promote. Creating an active LinkedIn page is a really helpful way to get noticed by companies. It isn't something that people tend to think about until after they've secured their first job. So getting ahead of the game and showing that you're a forward thinking young person is a great way to get noticed. Um, 
So now I'm going to hand over to Ryan, who's going to talk a little bit about interview tips. Perfect. Thanks, Ella, um, for some of those really useful CV tips. And, and like Ella mentioned there, if you're not already on link on LinkedIn or have an account on LinkedIn, um, I'd recommend if you've got some time a bit later this afternoon to, to sort of hop on there and try and fill out as much information as possible. The uh, the cybersecurity community is sort of really helpful, really engaging. And so, you know, if you feel free to, to reach out to anyone, and I'm sure they'll be happy to help you on your journey. Um, but yeah, once you've submitted your CV, the next possible stage or the next likely stage would be an interview. Um, and again, preparing for interviews, whether face to face, over video, over telephone, will always slightly differ. But in all cases, there's always several things that I think you should consider beforehand. Um, and so the first one would be utilizing job specs. Now, where possible, it's always helpful to have a, a job spec or a sort of detailed bit of information about the role, um, sort of outlining what the role will entail, um, you know, the types of experience the employers are looking to see. Um, I'll be the first to admit that sometimes these job specs or or bits of information on the role can sometimes be a bit overkill and maybe sometimes confusing. A lot of hiring managers and, and some hiring managers I've spoken to previously have said, um, you know, even, even sometimes the job specs are, are more confusing than helpful, but there's definitely going to be information and relevant information that you could, can pull from it. So I'd always uh, advise before going into an interview that you get that from whether it's a recruiter, the organization, the, um, the job advert you've applied to. Um, there's always going to be some relevant information there for you. Um, and again, I always advise my candidates to look at each of the responsibilities that are listed in the job spec. Um, note down any previous experience that you've got relating to that, whether that be for yourselves, any sub skills related experience, or like Ella said, and like Catherine touched on, the, the softer skills, whether that be, you know, communicating with people, sort of C-level people or, you know, um, senior people in organisations, whether that be delivering presentations, for example, or anything along those sorts of lines. If you've got experience that relates to that I guess that bit of um, that responsibility, um, I'd always note it down. Um, and again, you know, this task can often help sort of bring the information to the forefront of your mind so that, you know, when prepping for an interview, you've got that you know, ready to to say or speak to um, you know, when talking about it with the interviewer. Um, and can be particularly useful, especially if you're doing a telephone interview, to have a, a, you know, a bit of paper with some of the notes that you've made relating to the job spec um, can always be helpful. So, yeah, utilising job specs is, is probably the first tip. I think, you know, like I said, there's some good information on there, um, but do take it with a pinch of salt, as I always say to my candidates. Um, the next one would be dress code. Obviously, given the, the current situation globally, um, a lot of interviews are taking place either via video or via telephone. Um, there's only a few cases where I've heard someone having to go in for a face-to-face -face interview, and that's often to deliver some form of presentation. Um, but yeah, I'd always recommend wearing something smart. Uh, it's better to be overdressed than underdressed in that sense. And, you know, where possible, it's worth doing your research beforehand um, to, you know, you could look at their LinkedIn profiles um, of anyone who's working there currently. Um, it might say on the job spec, it could say on their website, what type of company they are. Um, and, and feel free to reach out to people who, who work in that organization and, and say that you're, you're interviewing there and ask them some questions or for some tips beforehand. But um, yeah, I'd always take it up a notch from whatever they recommend or whatever they say, just to show that you're serious about the opportunity. Um, uh, so that is something to keep in mind, especially if doing a video interview nowadays. Um, next slide, please, Laura. Thank you. The third tip I'd always say is, you know, you need to always have questions prepared during the interview, there's always, almost always an opportunity for you to ask questions of the interviewer. Um, an interview isn't just there for yourself to sell them or sell yourself to the employer, but for the employer to sell, number one, the opportunity, the role, the company um, and the organisation to yourself as well. So um, there will almost always be an opportunity to ask questions. I'd prepare several questions prior sort of to make the most of the opportunity. Um, I'm sure you'll probably be able to think of some, but there's always one question I recommend my candidates speak or ask during an interview, which helps convey, you know, they're not just thinking about what this opportunity can do for them, but also what the or what they can do to the for the organisation in that sense. Um, and that question is, you know, what does success look like for me in this role in the next three to six months? Uh, it will give you a bit of an outline as to the types of uh, projects you could be working on, the types of uh, responsibilities you're going to have in the role, but it also um, allows the organisation to understand that. You know, you're thinking about how your current skill set or maybe your skill set when you join the role can benefit the organization from that standpoint. But there, you know, like I said, you'll probably have a number of questions that you want to ask beforehand. Um, 
you know, there's a few others that might be you know, what are the most immediate projects that need to be addressed or you know what are the biggest challenges that someone might face in this position again some good questions to really sort of open um you know get them talking and give them a bit of insight and yourself a bit of insight into what the role could entail um and if you are doing it a few different places you know ask these organizations the same sorts of questions so that you can begin building a a case and an idea of you know should you get more than one offer or want more than one opportunity um, you can really sit down and make the right decision for yourself in terms of your career. So, yeah, make sure that you you have some questions prepared. And I'd almost never advise saying you haven't got any more questions or anything like that. Um, I've spoken to a number of clients who would view that as someone who's not particularly interested in the opportunity or organisation. So, yeah, if, if offered the opportunity to ask questions, definitely take it. Um, the next point, again, research. Um, before an interview, um, it's always advised to do some research into the organization. There's really no excuse to turn up to an interview without any prior knowledge of the company, mm-hmm. especially in sort of today's day and age where, you know, you've got access to the internet. Um, a lot of information can be found online. Like Ellis said, LinkedIn is your friend. There's a lot of information about organizations on there and there should be uh, through to sort of the, the size of the organization, the sector they're working in. Um, and again, Google, if you just type in the name of the organization, or the specific sector or team that you're looking to potentially go into um, and click the news part. There'll be plenty of uh, news articles. It could be anything to do with you know, recent funding they've received, any sort of other projects that they're working on that might not be purely cybersecurity related um, uh, and, and things like that. So look at the company's history, size, presence in the market. Um, again, recent news articles and sort of use that and potentially build it into the interview so you know where possible you can bring things up again if you're asking questions and you've done some research you can ask the employer some questions but um some of the clients we've spoken to previously and i've spoken to have, have really said that what's what makes candidates stand out especially when there's a lot of them that they're interviewing is the prior research the prior knowledge of the organization have they looked into things like their corporate social responsibility are they helping any charity work or um, you know, are they, for example, doing something slightly off piece, maybe building affordable homes or, you know, looking into different areas. So any prior knowledge that you can sort of show and demonstrate that you, you've really looked into this organisation will make you stand out ahead of some candidates who aren't going to be doing that. So that would be my advice there. Um, and yeah, there's, I guess, the last point I was going to make. Uh, we haven't got this on the slide here, but I've done some uh, some research into some of the, the basic security questions that might get asked, you know, from a technical standpoint. Um, and so I thought I'd just share them with you um, to give you a bit of insight and uh, maybe this will help you further down the line when you're looking for your roles. But um, one of the questions that seems to come up a lot is around, uh, you know, what is a freeway handshake? I'm sure you guys understand this completely, but if you if you haven't come across it, it's always worth looking into. But effectively, it's, it's referring to TCP connections. Um, and there's a few steps there um, in sort of the networking side of things, you know, connections made between the server and the client. So that's established. The next step would be the server receives a, a SIM packet from the client node. And then the final step would be the client node receives the SIM packet, acknowledges it um, from the server and then responds with an acknowledgement packet back to the server. Um, and again, they might ask you questions around UDP connections, which obviously is, uh, is a way of saying they don't require that sort of freeway handshake to, um, to sort of communicate. There's no acknowledgement that the packet has been received from that standpoint. So that's one of the, the questions that interviews like to ask. And again, I'd advise doing some own, your own research into that and looking into how best to answer that sort of question. Um, another one they like to ask is around sort of HIDs and NIDs. Um, HIDs are you know, what applications are being sort of uh, used within the organization. And NIDs examine sort of the, the flow of information between the computers and sort of looking into the network traffic side of things. Um, if you're going for a pen testing role, which Catherine has mentioned, um, look into things like SQL, SQL injections. Um, and again, you know, especially at this sort of grad, you know, grad roles and things like that, they will always ask you what you're doing in your spare time. I think Ella and uh, Catherine have mentioned this on, on numerous occasions earlier, but you know, if you're doing things like Hack the Box, you know, things like your home lab, um, if you've got a mentor um, that you've met on LinkedIn or someone who's sort of guiding you through the market, you know, mention these sorts of things. Um, you know, they'll be assessing sort of the human element and, and really see if you have that passion for security. You know, it's not just a, a job for yourself. It's something you're genuinely interested in. So stay up to date with the latest trends, stay up to date with the latest hacks or uh, real life events that are going on. Um, and yeah, I'm sure 
there will definitely be an organisation or, or interviewer that will ask you questions around that. So hopefully some of these tips have been helpful for yourself. Um, I think that's going to be sort of the wrapping up of this presentation here. Um, but again, we sort of open the floor to any sort of questions that you have. And um, yeah, if you want to connect with us on LinkedIn, follow our page, things like that. It's definitely worthwhile because we put out some really good insightful um, pieces around different areas of cybersecurity in the current job market. But uh, yeah, floor, if you want to open the, the floor for any questions, then we'll be happy to answer them. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brian. And thank you, Catherine and Ella, for that really, really insightful presentation. Um, I will just reiterate what Ryan said. Please do feel free to you know, follow us on LinkedIn and connect with us on LinkedIn personally as well. If you know you want to talk to us privately about any of the things we've talked about today or just to kind of stay connected for the future, you know, it's definitely in your best interest to do that because we can definitely help you um, within the next few years. Um, but definitely as well in terms of like content on, and stuff on LinkedIn as well as jobs, it's, you know, it, it will be really beneficial for you guys to do that. So, um, yeah, we're just going to open the floor up to any questions now. So if you guys do have anything you want to say, feel free to put them in the chat box or unmute yourselves, you know, whatever, whatever you want to do. So I'm going to stop sharing this now. Um, I will kind of send this round to you guys if you want it. Um, but yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, that was some really interesting tips there. Um, just whilst we're waiting on some questions, hopefully students on the call, if you have got questions, please do use the chat box as Laura's invited you to. Um, this is a really good opportunity to speak with them now. Um, so just some of the things I, I picked up on that. Um, I thought the talk around the CV was really interesting and focusing it not necessarily on what jobs have you had in, in kind of you know part-time work as, as a young adult, let's say, but focusing more about how you've grown as an individual and that's kind of skills development piece. I thought that was really interesting. Um, and so I, I guess um, the other thing to that is thinking about what, what the kind of typical jobs are that you would imagine a final year student applying for. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I speak to quite a few <clears throat> final, I mean, I've just placed two final year students um, who, <clears throat> who'd interestingly been studying, they'd had their, done their CEH um, and they had done their OSCPs actually, which is really tough. It's really, really tough. I don't hear many people passing that first time. So just, just putting that out there for common knowledge. If you pass it first time, you're amazing. Um, but yeah, I see quite a lot of people going into junior pen test roles um, or like a level one security operations role. So that's obviously the difference between the red and the blue team. Um, like I said before, you know, the GRC start side of things, so InfoSec analysts as well. I think um, LinkedIn is also a, a really great tool. Obviously, I don't want to put ourselves out of a job because, you know, LinkedIn might take, up, take over from us recruiters one day, but we're all about helping everybody in any way possible. And I think you know, you can you can set up a job alert on LinkedIn. You can go in in the in the search button and you can literally put in, you know, information security analyst, SOC analyst, security analyst, security engineer, infosec engineer. You can you can write all of those titles and there's a little button you can click, which is to um, save uh, save alert or something like that. Job alert. Mm -hmm. and you just click it and then all those jobs will come to you. You might get a recruit recruiters job sent to you but you'll also get direct companies sent to you as well. So um, I think, yeah, the analyst, the engineer, those types of roles. Um, and if you if you see any kind of graduate roles as well, any, you know, sometimes they have the word graduate in it. So you, you could even you could even set up a search which says graduate and cybersecurity. And any anyone that posts a, a job on LinkedIn, whether it's a recruiter or a direct company, if they've got that word in their in their job advert, that will go in your inbox and you can apply for it. So yeah. Okay, great. So um, oh, I was just about to ask one more question. I've just seen also a student question come in. Uh, so if I, if I may, because um, your, your example of the OSCP was quite interesting, because uh, for the students who are on the call who are perhaps thinking, oh, um, I haven't done OSCP yet. It's, it's kind of a bit beyond me uh, at this stage. Um, how, what's, what would your advice be to a student in that position? Obviously, there's a lot of things they could be doing in free time and how they, um, that's why I've touched on that point of um, saying, you know, this is the skill set that I'm busy developing during my time at university rather than saying, 
these are the jobs I've worked in. But for the student who might be sat there thinking, well, you know, I'm not quite ready for the OSCP, um, but I'd love to do it in, say, three or four years' time. What any, Anything that you could offer to a student like that that you could say for them to help at this point? 100%. And I think we, we kind of touched on this before. So um, I, I, I've just placed a, a pen tester with no experience and who had done a bit of development work, who had um, so he'd shown himself to be quite a strong developer. And actually, the company that have hired him, um, I think they want him for mobile app pen testing. Um, so the fact that he's got some development background is is really is really handy. Um, we we touched on a few things. You've probably heard us say like hack the box, capture the flag. Um, there's you know th they're, they're great ones. There's also you know a lot of conferences. You know maybe not now. <laughs> We're not allowed to go to conferences, but B sides. Um, You'll be so surprised at how we've seen so many really strong candidates just just t you know turn up to all these different conferences, and when they're there, they they see who are the companies that are really recruiting, and that they'll speak to a lot of people like us as well. But by going to those events, and they are still happening, they're just virtual now. So getting your name, you know, go turning up to those events where you can you can listen to speakers like Kevin Fielder. So. Mm -hmm. He's a great one to follow, by the way. He actually sits on our board here at LT Harper. He was the CISO at Just Eat, and he's now gone on to, I should know this, and I can't remember, a finance company, but um, he's great. He, he's the kind of person you could all connect to and say, hi, Kevin, we've just been listening to LT Harper's you know, uh, webinar. Um, we've been told to connect to you, and he just posts things every day. He'll post actual technical cybersecurity stuff. He's a CISO. So we're recruiters, we're not technical, whereas he he knows the techie stuff inside out. Um, join those groups and things like that. So, um, yeah, so hack the box, Thanks. capture the flag, <laughs> conferences, you know, maybe do some technical work like development, scripting, coding, all of those kind of things. Um, and just show show that you're passionate. You know, one of the biggest questions we, we hear that people get asked is, you know, what, what are the biggest hacks? So, Keep up to date with with what are the biggest hacks and people can get really caught out on that question, because if you're a week too late, you know, are you really up to date with it? Um, there's always a hack the, the latest hack. There's probably a hack. There's a, there's a new hack every second. So it's it's a really clever question. Make sure, Be careful how you answer that, <laughs> I'd say. Excellent. Thank you, Catherine. I mean, I, I think that kind of touches on uh, Amit's question here as well. Um, he says, uh, could you please guide what to do for perfect pen testing, how to start a career? Um, if, if I may just start that off and then I'll hand back over. You know, a lot of this comes down to how can you demonstrate that passion and enthusiasm? This is this is a career which, um, you know, it requires a lot of kind of self-drive, self-motivation. You, as you've just saying, Catherine, it's about keeping up to date what's actually going on in, in the industry, in the wider sphere. Um, and so it's really about demonstrating that you you know what's going on and that you're passionate and you're interested to keep on learning more because it's all it's always about learning. Um, you will never know it all and you'll always try and know it all, but you'll never quite get there. But yeah. you keep trying. So perhaps if I hand over. Yeah. And it's not just about buying the most expensive pen test course or an OSCP or anything like that, because not everybody can afford those. And they they take a lot of time and effort and money. And, you know, we've placed some excellent people who have just been really passionate. And that passion has come through because they're really knowledgeable, because they've taken the time to research and, and follow people and, and just understand the market, you know, um, and that you can do all of that on LinkedIn. You know, that is a free tool that you can do all of that on. Join groups, follow people like Kevin Fielder, follow us. Um, we don't we don't know it all, but we 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 try and share anything that we've got. Um and, and follow big companies, follow, you know, click on click on news, you know, yeah, keep up to date with what the latest hacks are, I would say, hundred percent in pen testing. <laughs> I would say that not just the pen but you know, just generally. Um, actually touching on something that Ryan mentioned earlier, finding yourself a mentor can be so, so helpful. Like, I can't stress that enough because I myself am still a university student, not in cyber, but um, I know how it feels to kind of have that whole kind of workforce ahead of you. You think, what do I do? Where do I start? It's, it's, it's really overwhelming. But having a mentor 
someone who's, you know, maybe 10 years older than you, that's been there, done that, was in exactly your position and can tell you step by step, you know, this is what I did and it worked for me. You don't necessarily have to do exactly what they did, but it's just helpful to see somebody like you who was in a similar position to yourself achieve it. And I think it's it's all about that kind of representation. If you can see someone else has done it, it makes it a lot less intimate, a lot less more intimidating for you because you know that it's possible. So, you know, you can ask them about soft skills, you can ask them about technical skills, anything at all, even if it's maybe perhaps how to negotiate a salary, because something that they never teach you, um, or, you know, how to get started, how to write perfect CV, all these kinds of things. And you can find mentors, um, again, as Ryan was saying earlier, the cybersecurity industry is quite close knit and they're really, really helpful. They, they want to help people. Um, and this is this goes back to using LinkedIn. So you can join groups, like Ella said, if you join a group and post a status or even just on your own page and say, look, I'm looking for a mentor. This is who I am as a person. I'm studying this and this is where I am in my journey. Is anybody willing to help me? I guarantee you'll get loads of people um, coming to you and asking, you know, can they help? And if, you know, if that fails, which I'm pretty sure it won't, but if it does, you can always ask us as well. We can put you in contact with people who we know that would be willing to help you. You could even join the mentorship service, you know, all these types of things. It's it's really, can't stress enough that networking is really, really key. And it's really about who you know as well as what you know. I've so seen that, that with the London Ladies Hacking Society, who is not just for ladies. Um, they are very welcoming. You know, they will help you. They will do everything for you, you know. So you, you turn up to one of their events and you get... I think their last meeting was in the Google office and it's all free food and drink and, you know, and you have speakers and people like us will probably sponsor those events, you know, just to make sure that networking events are happening. We, we have sponsored their events before. And I was I was really impressed with how inclusive they are and how everyone just chats and nobody knows each other, but they just chat at the end. And then, you know, each other moving forward, you connect on LinkedIn and you, you just help each other out. It's it really is. Um, I think cyber, like you, as Ryan and, and Laura have said, it is a really interesting community to be part of. Um, and I think once you just get into a few groups and your name starts to pop up and you start to see a few people like London Ladies Hacking Society, like Kevin Fielder, like LT Harper, you start to follow these companies and you and you and, and you you see that you can see the community. You know, there's some there's a guy called JJ Davy. He's brilliant. You know, we follow him. I always recommend his interesting posts. And there's some you know people people argue, people have got opinions, but there you go. It's the way it is. That's the way of the world. So. I, I'd add in, <clears throat> I'd also add in InfoSec Twitter yeah. because I find that incredibly useful and I I retweeted a mentoring offer uh, earlier this week. For the undergraduates, we also have a LinkedIn group and because the programme has been running so long, <coughs> sorry, my voice is going, <coughs> because the programme has been running so long, we've got a uh, several people in quite senior positions, in some cases very senior positions, and they might have graduated 10, 15 years ago, but they're still part of that group. And we used to try and organise formal mentoring, which has sort of gone off the boil. But if you post a question within the group of the other members, these are all people who've gone the same degree path as you as well. Um, and finally, in the before times, we actually hosted B-Sides Bristol. And one of the first speakers there was speaking on behalf of her, her employer with her boss on the MITRE ATT&CK framework. And I like that video because she was one of our grads speaking here. But attend conferences, definitely, and try and speak at them. There's lots of rookie tracks. 100%, 100% agree with that. Yeah, I just had another question pop up actually as well. Um, I don't know if um, maybe Ella or Ryan want to take this one. As an international student who already has experience outside of the UK, will my previous experience be considered by UK companies when I apply? Um, I think in the short answer to that is uh, yes, it will be considered. Um, I think experience is experience, although um, you know some organisations. You know, will probably take that into account. It's not UK experience, but it's still experience nonetheless. So there might be slightly different frameworks or slightly different things that, you know, um, you've been doing a slightly different way of working there. Um, but for the most part, you know, the experience would be classified as experience. And I don't think it's going to be an issue. Um, so I don't know what area in particular of cybersecurity or 
um, if it's not cyber security, what area you know, you've, you've had the experience in, but um, you'll be doing some similar stuff. It just might take a little while to get up to speed with how the UK market um, sort of works in regards to that area of experience. Um, so that would be my two cents on that. Often, I, you know, we place a lot of um, candidates who don't have any UK experience. Um, and I'll be honest with you, sometimes those candidates I place will say, look, Catherine, I want to go in and prove myself. I'll, I'll maybe go in, a, you know, a little bit less money than someone who's, who knows that UK market. But for a client, that's someone who's really hungry. And, you know, if you're willing to take that risk and say, do you know what, you know, the market's probably paying this much, but I'll, I'll take a little bit less, you know, but once I've proved myself, I can go in and, you know, you can pay me, if you think I'm worth it, you pay me what I'm worth once I've proved myself. You you are a better candidate because you're going in absolutely with something to prove. You're going in chomping at the bit, you know, and you're going in, you know, whereas other, other candidates might be like, well, I've got nothing to prove here. I'm all right. You know, I can sit tight or I can go and find something else. So I think quite often candidates like yourself, you're quite appealing, actually. It's 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 a uh, we, we place a lot of candidates um, who don't have any UK experience. So um, so, yeah, I think it'll be absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah. No, I think um, I, one of the pen testers I've placed came over from Madrid, for example. Um, pen testing is pen testing. You know, that skill set is not going to change. So, um, yeah, I think, they, you know, like Catherine said, they'll, they'll view it, um, you know, quite almost relevant experience, but you know, might, might be worth looking at it from the, the standpoint Catherine's mentioned there with, I've got to come in. I'm going to prove myself. I'm going to learn the UK market because it might be slightly different to the market you're, you're the market you've had some exposure to. Excellent, thank you. Okay, um, conscious of time, we've just gone over the one hour mark. So, thank you ever so much for being able to join us today. It's been really interesting to get an insight and really valuable for our students. And hopefully, you know, in the coming weeks and months. They'll be approaching LT Harper, looking for those first jobs and being able to get out into the industry. So if students have got any queries or questions that they want to follow up with, um, please feel free to either pass them on to me and I can forward them on, or I believe you should have uh, LinkedIn details, Twitter details, all the rest of them, so you can reach out to LT Harper directly. So again, thank you ever so much for joining us today. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> And Thank you. Hopefully we'll see you again soon. Definitely. Thanks. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.